Spring has sprung. A lot warmer since the last time I talked to you guys. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Valley Egg Pile channel. I'm Andy, your host, who forgot to do an intro video for the Sim Flight Part 2. So here I am in my front yard at the end of April now, uh, just finishing up the video, but I had no introduction, so here it is. Hey, quit chasing the ducks. Hey, bear, Millie, come on. It's not on season yet. I apologize for the delay on this video. Um, I didn't intend for it to take this long. I had some things going on as I announced on my Instagram page, which if you're not following, check it out at Valley Egg Pilot. Um, I decided to switch jobs. So I took a job with a different operator um, and I've kind of been bouncing back and forth out there helping them on the ground right now before we start flying. And uh, I just haven't had the time to get that video done. And on top of that, behind me here, as you can see, there's my shed, and then there's a house on a trailer, and then the house we have right now. And uh, some stakes out in the ground here. I'm building a house. YouTube isn't a source of income for me right now. It's kind of a hobby, which I thoroughly enjoy, and I enjoy making videos for you guys. But I have to try and balance this all to make it work, you know, between the new job and building this house and all that. It's, uh, it's kind of been a lot. So I'm going to do my best to try and keep up with things. I'm going to tell you right now over the summertime, it's not going to be consistent. It's just not. That's how it has to be. I have to, I have to be, I got engaged too, by the way. I have to be a good fiance to my fiance and uh, I have to take care of my house project and I got to take care of my job first. So unfortunately, you know, that kind of puts video making down towards the bottom, but I'm going to do my best. I will be keeping up on Facebook and Instagram. Hey, hey, get out of the pond. So yeah, you guys go ahead, keep up with me this summer, uh, at Valley Egg Pilot on Instagram and at Valley Egg Pilot on Facebook as well. In this video, I'm going to be going over all the emergencies we did and doing the comparisons from day one to day three. On top of that, we're going to be talking about positive starter control, an interesting way um, how we hold the starter switches on an air tractor. Um, on top of that, uh, we have a really long briefing at the end. It's about 10 minutes long. I encourage you guys, I'm sure you just kind of want to watch the action stuff, but do your best to make sure you watch the whole entire debrief. There's a lot of good information in it. There's a lot of things we talk about that we all should consider as egg pilots when we're working this summer. Um, so make sure to try and have some patience and check that one out. So without further ado, here it is. So if any of you have ever loaded or flown an air tractor before, you've definitely seen how everybody starts them. And they always put their hands down here, one finger on the start switch and the other finger on the igniter switch. And while I've been here, <coughs> Tom has taught me a little different method for this. So instead of having both your fingers down here, we're gonna take your entire right hand up on top <coughs> right here thumb on the starter switch so you have positive control of the starter all the time. So then we'd flip around with the other hand and hit the igniters into the start position. Tom's going to tell us why having positive control of the starter switch is important and why the hand positioning that he's teaching me is going to help us have better positive control. The main reason you want positive starter control is if you would happen to have a hot start or a hung start or any, any type of start of procedure that you would need to do a dry motoring run with the engine. With the, your hand in that position using your thumb, it gives you positive starter control and it won't allow your hand to be as tired or your finger to slip off that starter switch inadvertently during a dry motoring run. So that way you ensure that the dry motoring run is done thoroughly and completely. Uh, the other the other reasoning that we I teach this method is it also helps ensure that you are not inadvertently adding, introducing fuel to the system before you reach your 12 to 15 percent NG. This sequence I teach teaches you to take your hand off the fuel condition lever to engage the igniters, so you're always engaging your igniters before you are introducing fuel, which will it will help ensure to not have a hot start. And I can say after starting an air tractor for three days about 10 to 15 times a day that 
my thumb never actually got sore while I was reaching down here holding this. I mean, I would do, what, five starts in a row where I would be dry motoring the engine and my thumb never got sore. It never slipped off the starter switch once. So it's definitely something for everybody to consider, you know, even though we don't have hot starts on a regular basis, you know, the day could come that you do have a hot start and you need to dry motor and, you know, what happens when you get nervous in that situation, you start shaking your fingers sweaty and it slips off, it might be better to have it, you know, how Tom's saying and have better positive control. In this scenario, my fuel filter clogged. You'll notice the fuel pressure dropping and a low fuel pressure warning light coming on. My response is to turn the electronic boost pump on and you'll notice that my time is actually very similar, day one being on the left, day three on the right, but I'd like to point out my position I was in the top of the turn on day one and in my turns is when I typically scan my engine instruments. So going across the field I'm typically not scanning my engine instruments because I'm focusing while I'm on the deck. In this scenario the turbine has a flame out. Watch the torque drop to zero and ITT begin to fall. Notice on day one I hesitate to respond to the emergency. Also I forgot to mention on day one Tom is telling me when the emergency is coming and that is not the case for day three. In this final comparison, the fuel control unit fails, which is indicated by a spike in ITT. When this happens, all fuel must be cut to the engine to prevent a fire. If I'm lucky, I can get the prop feathered in time to extend my glide, which could help me in an emergency scenario where I need to get further to a better landing spot. Notice on day three, I did get the prop feathered and also the ITT dropped sooner than day one, meaning that I, I ran through my emergency checklist faster on day three than I did on day one. This situation is actually from day two. Tom threw me an IMC at 50 feet. I managed to keep it level and climb to 1500 feet. Then he gave me an FCU failure. This was a very overwhelming task because now I'm in the clouds and have no power to go up. But I managed it down to blow the clouds. And also popped out to find a road just in front of me to land on. Alright guys, so I'm here with Tom again. We just got out of the 502 sim for the last time. Definitely a great experience. I definitely feel a lot more confident in what I'm going to be doing this year. So we'll uh, run through with you guys what we did. So, you know, obviously the main thing that we're looking for in the turbine transition course is starting the airplane so that we're not hard, hot starting the, the turbine engine. So normal starts in here that we did we did hot and hung starts no lights and then we also did air starts so um, a mid-air restart of the engine we also did some engine failure stuff as well so we ran through flame outs prop governor failure fcu failure p3 air system failure fuel system failures we also did some imc stuff which is really eye-opening i don't know how many of you guys have instrument ratings i have mine Tom said he has his too. I'm not always instrument current, um, but I definitely should be. I got thrown into IMC a couple times. Not to toot my horn, but I did pretty good. I'm happy about that, but it's not inspiring me to go fly in IMC, that's for sure. When I was at 50 feet and you threw me into the clouds, I mean, that's, that's pretty scary. If that happened in real life, how do I know I'm gonna get that aircraft pitched up and I'm not gonna roll over and go inverted or something, you know? The reason we teach the IMC more than anything is so, to let guys know, just don't put yourself in that situation. It's it's not a good situation to try to put yourself out there when the weather's iffy and you probably know you should be sitting on the ground anyway. You might have your boss or the customer standing over your shoulder barking at you, tell you, oh, we need to get this done, we need to get this done. But it's, it's definitely not worth the risk because even if you have the skill set to be able to manage an aircraft, even for a short time in IMC, you're proud the outcome is probably not gonna be good regardless of how it is you know, how you can handle it or how long you can handle it. So that's that's the big reason we teach that, is just to 
keep yourself away from that situation and having to make that decision or put yourself in that position. So we did all these starts and Tom's gonna let us know a little bit about why it is so important that we go through all these starting procedures. Well the big thing is you know when turbine transitioning to a turbine aircraft you know the air the engine uh, operates you know entirely different than a piston engine does in a lot of aspects so you know and there's a lot more things that can go wrong obviously you know a hot start is the biggest thing that, that we're concerned with and and a hot start can be created as an improper starting procedure by the person trying to start the aircraft. So that's the big thing is, is teaching the proper way to start this engine and ensure that we don't have a hot start um, and potentially burn up an aircraft or burn up an engine. As most of you people guys out there know that uh, the engine on the on these aircraft is you know basically you know 50% of the cost of the aircraft so insurance companies definitely don't like it when <laughs> when you have an engine burn up due to pilot error, I guess, or a startup error. So that's that's the one thing we really try to hammer in is on this course is, is the startups and uh, the things that can go wrong during a startup also and being able to recognize that, whether it's you know a hot start and learning how to avoid a hot start of your own accord or how to recognize a hot start of something that might be malfunctioning in the engine that's not related to anything that you did. You know, also recognizing your no light situations where your igniter box maybe has gone out and uh, you're not getting fired of the engine and it's not firing off. So knowing the proper procedures to be able to mitigate that so when you do get that uh, issue fixed, that when you go to start the engine again, you don't have a bunch of bunch of fuel sitting in that engine that'll create an advert an explosion. You know, and then also your hung starts where your secondaries don't kick in. Uh, and allow your engine to come up to idle operating speed. So, um, you know, knowing how to, how to work those and remedy those situations is, is really important and definitely important, you know, to be able to be insured in one of these aircraft. And you're not going to get to practice these in a real aircraft. I mean, that's, that's not going to happen. And the best thing about the simulator is that you do get to experience the failure, the hung or the hot start, but then you also build the muscle memory to react to the situation. I mean, um, I hope you guys are able to see in the video, I'll point it out to you. I mean, my reaction time to all these things has definitely changed quickly over three days. I think that's all something that we should be striving for. You know, obviously, if you haven't gone through some sort of turbine transition, I mean, you've probably talked to somebody about these issues before, but you've never actually practiced them, more than likely. And, and I think, you know, even for the older pilots out there that are, you know, well-versed in a turbine engine, you know, if you haven't practiced this before or you haven't had to deal with this situation, I mean, it's definitely a good brush up on, on recognizing and reacting properly to the situation. That muscle memory, I mean, I, like, I can't stress enough that muscle memory definitely to me seems like something we should all have. We did a lot of in-flight engine failures, um, like I said, prop governor failure, FCU failures, um, flame outs things of that nature you know that's another thing that again guys you know you can't go out and practice this stuff I mean you can't go hop in your 502 and go intentionally flame out your engine I mean who in their right mind is going to do that you know we have the opportunity to use the simulator here to come practice that again you guys will definitely see in the video my reaction time from day one to and then to today it's faster every single day from running through it on a checklist to getting the muscle memory down yesterday to today where I think I was pretty rapidly moving through every single failure. Why, why is it so important for us to be able to recognize these and react in a prompt manner? Well, well the big thing is, is, is being able to keep anything, you know, I mean, people that have done instrument training, any type of flight training, you know, knows that you have a scan of your instruments, you know, knowing what's going on with that aircraft, you know, hopefully and generally at all times, you know, but doing the work we do, we're always low level, close to the ground, we have a lot of distractions, you know, besides uh, obstacles, whatnot, and just the job we're doing, um, so our surroundings in a whole, you know, so it's real easy to get distracted from what that aircraft itself is doing uh, and monitoring those, those instruments as necessary, you know, and some of these uh, emergencies, I shouldn't say even emergencies we put you through, but um, scenarios we put you in here, you know, are just things that deal with the scan, whether it be you know, uh, a fuel filter plug, you know, actual, an actuator light come off there or your generator out, just even watering lights or if you have a low oil pressure indication or 
low voltage, you know, just things that you should be able to catch in your scan if you're monitoring your airplane, you know, on a relatively frequently basis, you know, and what we try to teach is, is every turn you need to be scanning those instruments, you know, it's not just something you can do every 10 turns or every 10 minutes, it's something you want to do every turn, every time, so you're in tune with that aircraft at, at that whole time, you know, so you're able to catch any problems that may arise and, and mitigate those problems ahead of a major engine failure or a major disaster, you know, to try to, number one, save yourself, and number two, hopefully save the aircraft. Yeah, and we talked about this um, in our discussion and debrief yesterday. If I were to have an FCU failure going across the field this summer without the training I did in the sim, I definitely think I'd probably freeze up. I mean, I'd, I mean, we all can't say how we'd react in that scenario, but here you've built my confidence in recognizing the issues. And then on top of that, we've built the muscle memory to react to those situations. And now I'm at the point where if I'm in the field, the issue arises, I know I'll recognize it, I know how to respond to it, and I can, instead of getting that first instantaneous kind of, oh my God, there's an act, you know, something's about to happen, I'm reacting to the situation, and then I'm moving forward into finding, you know, if it's an engine failure, I'm moving forward into finding where I'm gonna land sooner, I'm confident that I've got all my fuel shut off to the engine, whatever I need to do for the situation to handle that. We need to take it upon ourselves to get as prepared as we possibly can for that situation when it arises you know i mean our ultimate goal is to come home every day right i mean we love our job we love spraying but the ultimate goal is to go do this what we enjoy and make it home first do i think that this uh, three-day sim course is worth it absolutely i think for a, a pilot a young pilot especially like myself um, transitioning into a turbine airplane from a piston, this was absolutely necessary. I can tell you right now, I know more about the engine, how it works, how to handle the airplane in, in um, emergency situations. I would highly recommend this course to anybody that is transitioning from a piston to a turbine powered aircraft. And on top of that, I think, you know, even recurrent training like we talked about too for, for older guys, because I, I mean, I. I know there's people out there that, like I said earlier, they they are experienced with turbine engines. They've dealt with them before, but you know, a little recurrent training never hurts. You know, it's just it's just like instrument training. You know, we you take a year, you two years off from instrument training, and we throw you in IMC, and then you know you're upside down, right? You know, and that 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 kind of I think it correlates a lot with also our emergency procedures too as well, and and recognizing those. You know. The more years you go without an accident, the easier it is to get more complacent, right? So what better way to keep your head in the right place than come do like a one-day course or something and, and get recurrent on, on how to handle your airplane, recognizing the issues and responding correctly. We're going to attach a link in the description below on this video so you can come check out the website where the simulator's at. Tom's contact information is in that link. So if you guys are interested in doing um, a one, two, or three-day course, um, you can contact him and talk about pricing for that and um, what all those courses will entail. He said yesterday you can also kind of tailor a course to anybody, so get a hold of him. You know, there's some people out there that need this for insurance. I wouldn't just do it because your insurance wants you to. I mean, come to it with a good attitude and, and, and take something away from it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. You taught me a lot this week. It was good. Um, man, I really appreciate it. I seriously do. We appreciate everybody, you know, that comes through it, especially, you know, Andy and, and everybody that wants to be here and support the program more than anything. Just be able to take some positive notes away from it and feel like it was worth their time and effort to be here and come through it. Not yeah. Just, uh, not just <laughs> sitting through a right. video game course because that's definitely not what it is. Yep, absolutely. No, it's, it's, it's not a video game, that's for sure. You know, let's be the change that makes that accident curve start going down a little bit further every year. You know, this is... This is a this is an opportunity for us to do that. Depending on the course and the and the price that you pay, I think I think this is a cheap insurance policy for your guys' operation. I like to look at it this way, what our mechanic says about wire cutters. It, it only has to pay for itself once. That's right. Right? I mean, if you're worried about the price, again, you know, you can't put a price tag on your pilot. And on top of that, if he can save your airplane too, because he's been through this training, I mean, what you know, what more could you ask for? So all right. Well, thank you guys for joining along with us. We'll see you next time.